church, um, please uh, stand for the call to worship. So good to be here. I'll be reading from Psalm 100, 1 through 5. This is a reading of God's word. It says, Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever. And his faithfulness to all generations. Let us pray. Father God, thank you, Lord, for the reminder. Lord, that you are good. and Lord, that you are faithful. Father, um, thank you that we have this opportunity to worship you. Lord, we know there's still so many things going on, Lord, in this world, and we pray, Lord, that you would receive all the praise and honor. Thank you for this time, Lord. And, um, pray for those that are traveling, and pray for those that are um, listening to us online, Lord, and we know that, Lord, that you are with us no matter where we are, Lord. So we want to lift this time to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Standing here in your presence Thinking of the good things you have done Waiting here patiently Just to hear your still small voice again Holy, righteous, faithful to the end Savior, healer, redeemer, and friend I will worship you for who you are I will worship you for who you are. I will worship you for who you are, Jesus. Standing here in your presence, thinking of the good things you have done. Waiting here patiently just to hear your still small voice again. Holy, righteous, faithful to the end. Savior, healer, redeemer, and friend. I will worship you for who you are. I will worship you for who you are. I will worship you for who you are, Jesus. I'll worship. I will worship you for who you are. I will worship you for who you are. I will worship you for who you are, Jesus. Your promise sure, your love endures away. My soul secure, your promise sure, your love endures always. My soul secure. Your promise sure, your love endures always. I will worship you for who you 
are. I will worship you for who you are. I will worship you for who you are, Jesus. I will worship you for who you are. I will worship you for who you are. I will worship you for who you are, Jesus. I worship. I will worship you for who you are. I will worship you for who you are. I will worship you for who you are, Jesus.
um, let's just pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we just um, thank you for this service time together. And God, this time to worship you. And we do cry, holy, holy, holy is the Lamb. And Lord, as we um, enter into Pastor Derek's message, I pray that you just open our hearts to hear what you have to say to us. And so we can be challenged and encouraged this week. In your name we pray, amen. Thank you everyone for joining us today and for those that are online with us. I do have a few announcements that we're gonna be sharing. There's one that we don't have um, up on the board and that's the need for volunteers. So there is a youth group volunteers that we need and that service is from 1145 to 1230. And if you're interested, please reach out to Pastor Josh in regards to our Sunday school grades three to six. Um, past, Melissa will be needing some support there as well, and those volunteers are from 10.30 to 11.30. And then we also need some volunteers for our Harvest Fest on October the 30th. As for our announcements this week, um, August the 10th, we have a weekly prayer meeting by Zoom. And so please feel free to come in and join. I haven't been able to join as frequently myself, but it's always open for prayer with the church. And then we also have um, children's ministry prayer a parent meeting that we'll be having on August the 14th. The week after that, we're gonna be having a congregational meeting where Pastor will be speaking about the state of our church, and then Pastor, uh, Deacon Dan will be speaking about our finances and where we're going. And then finally, on August the 28th, there will be a children's meeting, um, teacher's meeting for with, with Melissa as well. And then I just want to remind everyone that we will be having our um, church retreat uh, Labor Day weekend. And that's it for announcements. Thank you, Jennifer. Is that the first time you've given announcements in a long time or ever? Huh. Yes. <laughs> okay. She did a wonderful job, right? Everybody's got to do something the first time. And uh, from then on, you're an expert, so. It's the uh, first Sunday of the month, and as is our uh, tradition, really, we celebrate the communion, the Lord's Supper. And communion, it's recorded in, in John chapter 14, is a time when we come together and we remember what the Lord Jesus Christ did for us. In John 14, it talks about the fact that he was in an upper room with his disciples, and they were feeling scared and alone. He says, I'll be with you. And he had a last meal with them where he broke bread and, and drank the cup. And so he said, do this as often as you uh, do this in remembrance of me. And so we take this time once a month to take of the bread and the cup. Communion is not for perfect Christians. If it was, none of us would be able to take it. But it is for Christians. It's those who place their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation and uh, the cleansing of our, our sins from us. So if that's where you're at, we're, we'd invite you to take of the elements. If you're not a believer, we'd ask you to not take them, not that it won't do anything, it just has no spiritual benefit for you. So before we do that, I'd like you to take a few moments and just bow your head and take this time to confess any sins, anything that the Holy Spirit is putting on your heart that you need to take care of with the Lord. Would you do that right now? Let's pray. Father, we come to you um, humbly, recognizing that it is a privilege to be your children. It's a privilege to have Jesus Christ as our brother and our savior. And we recognize what he did so long ago. We pray that we would appropriate these elements in a reverent and holy manner, recognizing what it cost you, the sacrifice of your son. We ask that all these sins that have been lifted up to you and confessed that, Lord, you have forgiven us. You say, as far as the east is from the west, you've removed our transgressions. You say, if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us of all of our sins and cleanse us from unrighteousness. So we're going to take you at your promise, Lord. And we're going to thank you for this time to come together in communion. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. On the night that the Lord was betrayed, uh, 1 Corinthians 11, the Apostle Paul says, he took the bread and broke it. 
And after he did, he said, take, eat, do this in remembrance of me. The, the bread, if you have it right now, represents the broken body of Jesus. When he went to the cross, he died. And literally his body was put on that cross for us. So when you and I take of this element, we appropriate that and thank the Lord for what he's doing. Let's take together. The Apostle Paul goes on and says, in the same way, take the cup, which is the new covenant, the new promise in my, my blood. So the cup represents the spilled blood of Jesus Christ dying on the cross. The Bible says, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. So the Lord Jesus Christ died on that cross, shed his blood for us so that we might be cleansed for him. So when we take of this, it's not any supernatural means of salvation, but it makes us, it helps us to remember what the Lord Jesus Christ did in shedding his blood for us. Let's take together. Father, thank you for allowing us to come to your table. Lord Jesus, thank you for spilling your blood for us. And Holy Spirit, thank you for giving us the power to live victorious lives. We pray that we would continue to live for you. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, uh, it's another Sunday, and we're very thankful. Now we're heading into August, and fall is coming, and a lot of kids, I've seen it on Facebook and other means, are going back to school, and that's exciting. Some of the kids are transitioning, which is great, going into kindergarten or school. Some, like my son, is going into his junior high year. So it's a great time. It's an exciting time. And those of us who are done with school, yay, we're done. You know, but we praise God that um, Chandler Prep has allowed us to use this uh, facility to meet. And so I hope you're thankful for what it is. But the school is in full blast right now. And we're just thankful that we have kids that we can minister to. Well, we're going to continue on in our series in the book of Genesis. So if you have your Bible, open up to Genesis chapter 37, your tablet, your phone, whatever you want to use. And two weeks ago, if you remember, Pastor Josh spoke last week. I'm very thankful for that, Pastor Josh. But two weeks ago, we talked about the perils of being the oldest in your family. And I raised, had you raise your hand. And most of you were the oldest in your family. But now I want to turn it around. How many of you are the youngest in your family? One, two, not as many, not as many. So we saw the perils of being the oldest. We looked at Reuben, the firstborn of Jacob. We saw how he fit the mold of being the oldest, being responsible, taking leadership in his family. But if you recall two weeks ago, we saw, unfortunately, you'll remember that Reuben went too far. And we saw how his personal ambition got in the way of obedience to God and in honoring his family. So today we're going to look at another young man, Joseph, the second youngest son of Jacob. And I've entitled this message, The Perils of Being the Youngest. Because those of you who know the story of Joseph know that he went through a lot of trials in his very young life. Now, most of what we're going to cover today, and we're going to look at him uh, in two weeks, most of what we're going to cover today is found in chapter 37 of the book of Genesis. And the crisis that we're looking at this morning happens near the end of the chapter. And so the story begins with Jacob, who was renamed to Israel, remember, when he wrestled with God, and, and has Joseph go out and check on his brothers who are watching over the family flock. And we come across this very long narrative, but I think it, it really helps us to understand what's going on. So turn to Genesis 37, 17b and follow it. And so this is what it says. It says, so Joseph went after his brothers and found them near Dothan. But when they saw him in the distance and before he reached them, they plotted to kill him. Here comes that dreamer, they said to each other. Come now, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns and say that a ferocious animal devoured him. Then we'll see what comes of his dreams. When Reuben, we talked about Reuben a couple weeks ago, when Reuben heard of this, he tried to rescue him from their hands. 
oh, let's not take his life, Paul. Huh? He said, don't shed blood. Throw him into the cistern here in the desert. Don't lay a hand on him. Why he did that was Reuben was intending to rescue him and take him back to his father. Verse 23, so when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the richly ornamented robe he was wearing, and they took him and threw him into the cistern. Now the cistern, which normally held water, was empty, right? It was empty, no water in it. As they sat down to eat their meal, they looked up and saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead. And their camels were loaded with spices and balm and myrrh. And they were on their way to take them down to Egypt. Verse 26, Judah said to his brother, Hey, what will we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come on, let's just sell him and, and sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hand on him. After all, he is our brother. Uh, we shouldn't kill him. He's our own flesh and blood. And all the other brothers agreed. So when the Midianite merchants came by and his brothers pulled Joseph up out of the cistern, they sold him for 20 shekels of silver. And they gave it to the Ishmaelites who took him to Egypt. When Reuben returned to the cistern and saw that Joseph was not there, he tore his clothes. He went back to his brothers and said, the boy isn't here. Where can I turn now? And then they got Joseph's robe, slaughtered a goat, dipped the robe in the blood, and they took the ornamental robe back to the vault and said, we found this. Examine it to see if it's, whether it's your son's robe. Notice how they said your son's robe. They won't even use his name. That's how much enmity there was. Verse 33, he recognized and said, it is my son's robe. Some ferocious animal has devoured him. Joseph has surely been torn to pieces. And then Jacob tore his clothes, put on sackcloth, and mourned for his son many days. And all his sons and daughters came to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. No, he said, in mourning I will go down to the grave of my son. So his father wept for him. Again, I said this. I, put, I picked the book of Genesis and the relationship sound in as a sermon series because I think we can learn a lot from the relationships and how the members in this book treat each other. In this case, we see Joseph's brothers, his own flesh and blood, turning on him, intending to kill him. And maybe to ease their consciences a little bit to sell him off instead of outright kill him. And I thought as I was reading this, how did this family get into this situation? How can family members turn on other family members? i be honest, if you and I are honest with each other, it's not that unusual. Because we see and hear and honestly, we personally experience this kind of thing happening all the time. Siblings, brothers and sisters who won't talk to each other because they didn't get the rightful share, their perceived rightful share of the estate. The parents who won't talk to their child because they didn't marry the person that they shot, thought they should marry. The child who never visits his father because he felt oppressed by his authoritarian leadership. The daughter who won't speak to his mother, her mother because she didn't feel supported or loved by her. The cousin who won't speak to the other cousin because he didn't take his share of the family business and do his job. And by the way, I didn't come up with, you know, just make those up. I thought about them in my own life and people I've talked to. These are very real situations. And this is what happens. Family members falling out with other family members. Maybe it's happened in your own family, among your own relatives, among even your own siblings, or parents, or children. But I think we can learn from Joseph and his family some lessons that will allow us to avoid making the same kind of mistakes that happened within this family. Let's do that. Let's open with a word of prayer and ask the Holy Spirit to be our teacher this morning. Father, thank you for this time. And we pray, Lord, that now, as we look into your word, that we would learn how to get along, how to avoid the problems that this family had. And Lord, there may be some right now who are challenged in their family situation. I pray that this, the Holy Spirit would illuminate things that they can do to help them overcome these problems. We thank you in Jesus' name, amen. So let's look at lessons on how to avoid problems within your family, among family members. And by the way, that also is church family. If you are in a church like ours, 
there are people who don't necessarily get along as well. Let's talk about that, all right? So the first one is very straightforward. Avoid holding grudges. Avoid holding grudges. Look at verse 2. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers, the sons of Bilhah and sons of Zilpah, his father's wives, and he brought their father a bad report about them. Now I want you to look at this this, uh, family chart that we looked at last time. Remember, these are the two daughters and these are their servants, right? And you see the family tree. Note that Joseph is the son of Rachel, who is the favored wife of Jacob. And so he's at the young age of 17 as a shepherd, like his father before him and all his brothers. He noticed that his stepbrothers, the two maidservants' sons, Bilhah and Zilpah, the, the brothers are Dan, Asher, Naphtali, and Gad, they're up to no good. We don't know what they did, okay? But it was something that was not in the interest of the father. So Joseph took it upon himself to, to go to his father and report their misbehavior. Now, we could look at this situation psychologically and say, well, perhaps these four went bad. You know, they weren't good sons because uh, their mothers were only servants. They weren't true chosen wives. Or perhaps they felt shamed. And they blamed their father, their mothers, their environment for why they were felt less valued than the other brothers. It was like that in my family. My grandmother, maternal grandmother, very traditional Chinese village woman. And she had four sons and two daughters, my mom and my Aunt Mary. And when she died, the sons and their sons got a share. And then, so that was like seven shares. And then my Aunt Mary and my mom split one share, okay, because they're daughters. She also said, why would I want a daughter to go to college? Just get married, take her home. So they were not favored. In the same way, the same thing. This is what I think they felt. And so we don't know why they felt this way. But what we do know is that they resented Joseph telling their father about what they had done. Now, those of you who've grown up with siblings, brothers and sisters, know the number one rule that exists between siblings. Parents, I'm sorry if I've got to tell you this, but it's true. The number one rule is this. When one of us gets into trouble, the others are not supposed to tell the parents, okay? Uh, There are names for a person like this, all of them negative. Squealer, snitch, tattletale, blabbermouth, jerk. And you know, we've all been in that situation where our sibling tells us, don't tell mom or dad, right? You've heard that, don't tell mom and dad. Because why? We're going to get in trouble. Well, the problem is that Joseph did tell dad. The question is this, was he right in doing so? And I think the answer is yes. But of course, none of us want to be found out about how we messed up. And we certainly don't want to be disciplined, punished, reprimanded for what we did. But I think Joseph was right in telling his dad what had happened. If his older brothers hadn't held a grudge against him for ratting on them, the whole mess that we saw at the beginning where he got tossed into the cistern wouldn't have happened. So for each one of us, we have to remember that if a brother or sister, or for that matter, a coworker or a fellow student or someone even in the church does something wrong, we shouldn't resent that, right? We, we need, if, the, if we do something wrong against them, we shouldn't resent it. We should own up to our mistake. So the first lesson to learn in avoiding problems with our family is to not hold grudges against another especially when you were the one that's wrong in the first place. There's a second thing that I I see in their family. It's this. Avoid developing favorites. Avoid developing favorites. Verses 3 and 4, look at it. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had been born to him in his old age and he made a richly ornamented, ornamented robe for him. And when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him. And they couldn't even speak a kind word about him. You know, my son's name is Benjamin. And actually, I think when we were looking at boys' names, first name popped up was Joshua. I like Joshua, right? But then we realized one of our friends in the church had a son named Joshua, which 
I honestly now think like, what does that matter? He's a friend in the church. It's not a relative, right? So we didn't name him Joshua. Next one I thought was, he, you know, if you want to pick a, a son in his old age, Joseph, the youngest son, the younger son of, of Rachel would have been it. But then Kathy's brother was named Joseph, so that didn't seem right. So we settled on Benjamin. Benjamin, the favored son in the father's old age, which is me. He's my favored son. That's how I came up with his name. Well, here, look at this situation. It was very obvious that Joseph was the favorite son of the bunch. And it wasn't just some new development. We can go all the way back to the beginning of chapter 33 to see his favoritism emerge. At that time, Jacob had decided to go back to the promised land, remember? And he's going to confront Esau, his older brother, the one he, he stole or took his birthright and blessing. And so he's afraid that Esau is going to kill him. And look at what Joshua, or Joseph, Jacob does. Chapter 33, verses 1 to 3. Jacob looked up, and there he saw Esau coming with 400 men, all armed. And so what does he do? He divides up the children among Leah, Rachel, and the two maidservants. And he put the maidservants and their children in front. And then Leah and her children behind. And then finally, Joseph and Rachel in the rear. Now think about those four sons from the servants, right? Gad, Asher, Dan, and Naphtali. Don't you think they'd be a little resentful? Man, dad doesn't love us. He puts us in front. So we're going to be the first ones killed. Dad thinks we're expendable. And look at what dad does to Rachel and that stupid son, Joseph. He puts them in the back. They're obviously favored. This grudge against Joseph has been nursed for a real long time. And now it's exacerbated, it's amplified by Jacob giving Joseph a beautiful coat, tunic. This cloak was multicolored. It would have been worn by youths of the richer class. It would have been worn, worn by royalty. And so this coat, as Joseph wore it all the time, would be a reminder to all the other brothers that they are not as valued as this son. They knew that it was a sign that Joseph would someday get a larger portion of the inheritance. Now, parents, I'll be honest with you. Since I'm a parent, I have three kids. I know that it's natural to have favorites among your children. Okay, I'm looking at Ben here and my daughter in the back. I'm wondering, too, do they think I have a favorite among them? I can tell you this. I've been a substitute teacher in this school. And when I look at the seven, eight, ten kids in my class, yeah, I do have some favorites. Okay, but what about my own children? Do we play favorites among our own children? I remember feeling that way when I was a kid. My parents, when I was in elementary school, gave me this nice purple bike when I was young. But my parents got my younger brother a nicer bike, okay? And then Dina, my youngest sister, or, you know, the youngest, she got the most pretty bike. It was pink, and it had little tassels and all that, you know? And, and so I wondered about that. Why did my parents give my, my brother a better bike? You know, it's natural to favor certain children. Some kids are just, let's be honest, more lovable, or beautiful, or smarter, or talented, or they have natural inclinations that just favor them. And Joseph was a young man that should have been admired, right? He had good character. We could all see why Jacob would favor him. But this preferential treatment can lead to problems in the family. And you know what's ironic? It's funny that we can show favoritism, especially when we might be the one who wasn't the favorite growing up. I mean, Jacob should have figured this one out, right? Because when he was growing up, his dad, Isaac, who did he favor? Jacob? No. He favored Esau. And his mom favored him. It leads to problems. But he continues the cycle, and that would lead to his son being sold into slavery. So the exhortation for all of us, those of you who have more than one kid, if you have one kid, they're always the favorite, right? But if you have more than one kid, for the sake of the families, we've got to fight the urge to have favorites. 
That doesn't mean that you treat the kids exactly the same because each child responds differently to different rewards and affirmations. But we need to seek out the strength of each one and resist carping on their weaknesses. And by the way, I did find out why my parents got my brother a better bike. Evidently, they were talking to the doctor. I was a severe asthmatic. So they spent an enormous amount of time with me as a sickly child, right? I'm the oldest. But they said, my, sister, my brother, the middle child, will feel neglected. So try to do extra nice things for him. As to my daughter, my, my sister getting the nicest bike, well, she's just a little princess. So that all makes sense. So when dealing with our families to avoid trouble, let's, let's avoid holding grudges. Second, let's avoid favoritism. Third, avoid feelings of jealousy. Avoid feelings of jealousy. Joseph didn't help his cause much when he went up to his brothers and he tells them two dreams that were given to him by God. Listen to these if you've never heard them before. It's funny. Verse 5. Joseph had a dream. And when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. He said to them, listen to the dream I had. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright while your sheaves all gathered around mine and bowed down to it. <laughs> his brother said, do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said. But he didn't end there, did he? He goes on and says, hey, I have another dream. And he told his brothers, listen, he said, I had another dream. And this time the sun and the moon and 11 stars were bowing down to me. And when his brother, uh, father, as well as his brothers, his father, when he heard this, his father rebuked him and said, what is this dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come down and bow to you before the ground? His brothers were jealous of him and his father kept the matter to his, uh, in mind. You know, Jacob didn't help his case with his brothers by telling these two successive dreams. Please note that he didn't tell these dreams in a prideful manner. He wasn't trying to brag. But in simplicity, he was just simply giving testimony. He's just simply sharing what God had done, the graciousness he had given. And that's good. We should do that. When God does something favorable for us, we should be able to share that. But it means that we don't brag about it. In any case, we do, we, when we, whenever we do such a thing, we need to make sure to do it in context and very sensitive to the people around us. And such was the case with Joseph's brother. The first dream, 11 sheaves, obviously represents them and they're bowing down to him. The second symbolizes chief role not only of the brothers, but the father, son, and the mother, moon. And why did God give him two dreams? You guys, if you've studied the book of Daniel, remember that when uh, he had the dream twice. And, and, and the king asked him, why did I get the same dream twice? It's a confirmation that this will happen. By having the same dream twice, it's saying this is going to happen. Please note Jacob's response to his son. He does rebuke him. He says, son, um, you're kind of upsetting your older brothers. And you're not making me feel good about myself. Nevertheless, he realized that this was going to happen. God had chosen Jacob to rule over Esau, his older brother. And now his son, Joseph, would be ruling over his brothers. He gets it. He sees it. It's not a good thing for the other brothers, but that's the way it is. So what's the lesson for us? Maybe, maybe you excel over your brothers and sisters in a certain way. For me, with regard to my brother, I excelled in academics. Uh, for my brother, he excelled in sports. You know, in 50 years, my brother played tennis. He was varsity tennis and everything. I have never beaten him ever in any game in tennis. In anything, he mocked me all the time, right? I couldn't beat him. I, he lettered in tennis. I lettered in chess. Okay, they didn't even have a letter, okay. He was part of the ski club, I was part of the math club. My brother excelled in sports, but I, on the other hand, and you know, I always had to have that put in my face, but he had to endure teachers that two years later he would have to listen to and they say, why can't you be like your brother in biology or English or history? And you know what, friends, I could have strived to get better in sports, 
try to beat him, but why? It doesn't do anything. It just, you know, and he could have strived to, you know, have a more prestigious academic career than me, but why? It doesn't matter. Each one of us is good in what we are. And we need to recognize that God has gifted me, God has gifted my brother and sister in different ways. So instead of being jealous about them, we should be thankful that God has made you, made you, made you, made me the way we are. We don't have to look up to the other person. There's one more lesson I think we can learn from this saga, and that is this, from Joseph himself. Even though he was righteous in every way, the lesson we can learn from him to avoid troubles in our family is to be a little more sensitive. A little more sensitive. It was obvious that Joseph was a favorite. And it's also com true compared to his brother. He was a more noble character. He's righteous. He's faithful. He's honest. He's pure. And all that he did, he said, was done with the right motives. He was actually pure at heart. He was blessed and favored by God. But nevertheless, I think in retrospect, when I look at <laughs> Joseph's life, he could have been a little more sensitive in how he treated his brothers. He could have been more careful about not wearing that coat around them. Uh, he could have told them the dream in a more discreet manner. He could have been more restrained in telling, tattletaling on his brothers. I mean, the accumulation of all those things that he did to his brothers finally got them so ticked off. They're like, I've had it with you. And by the way, it caused him pain in the end, right? But we're going to see in two weeks from now in the message, not all bad. Because in the final message of the series, we see that God had his plans for everything. So we need to be a little more sensitive. Let's face it, God has endowed each one of us with gifts, abilities, even beauty that others around us don't have. Some of you can score 95% and higher on the SAT. Some of you are the star player on your athletic team. Some of you, your boss only trusts you to complete the project. Some of you in your job, you're the only one who will get promoted because nobody else even comes close to who you are. And so with these blessings, the goal should be not to downplay what God has given us. Don't be pseudo humble about it. But on the other hand, we need to be sensitive to others in not showing off what, what has been given to us over the others. You know, I recall a mother telling me in a conversation, she had her child in the car and she was helping to take one of the classmates home. The classmates were not as financially well off as their family. And the other child had mentioned that they needed a copy of the homework assignment. And the woman said, well, we can go to our house and make a copy on our printer. And, and she said, that would be great. And her daughter went up to her friend and said, you mean you don't have a printer at home? That's just being a little insensitive, right? Not recognize it. I know some kids who live in Northern California Northern California, the bear, who had annual passes to Disneyland every year. And it would be insensitive for them to go up to friends who've never gone to Disneyland at all and say, oh yeah, we go every year. Parents take us flies down. Um, cruises. I remember one of my kids said this. Um, one of the kids said, yeah, I've gone on seven cruises. And my kid was just amazed until they really calculated and said, oh my gosh, I think we went on more cruises than that. Now, they didn't say that, but you've got to be sensitive, right? There are some people who've never been on a cruise. And so for us to brag about that stuff, just matter-of-factly, it doesn't do anybody any good. We can be thankful that we got a promotion or we got a raise, but it's not good to tell that to a person who just got laid off. Or you can say that I have a clean bill of health and recognize that the person you're telling has just been diagnosed with cancer. We just got to be real careful. All these things I just mentioned are common sense, but we just got to be sensitive to the people around us to not make them feel worse about the situation. 
So think about those relationships you have with people and where it may be a struggle for you, whether it's in your family or in the church or in your workplace or in the school. We can be better in terms of our relationship with them. When I was a kid, there was a popular book called, I know it sounds really boring, and it would be to any kid today. It's called Jonathan Livingston Siegel. I mean, you're like, gosh, that sounds really bad. And this book, it extolled the virtues of independence and individuality at any price. And so it takes a look through the eyes of a seagull and how they live, you know. The seagull is a popular subject for photography. And it's easy to see why. A seagull exults in its freedom. When flying alone and thrusts its wing back and soars through the air, it's just a magnificent bird to watch. It has powerful strokes, climbs higher and higher, majestic loops and circles. But here's the problem. When a seagull, instead of being alone, is in a flock with other seagulls, it becomes a different kind of bird. His majesty dissolves into infighting and cruelty. And you know what I'm talking about if you've been around you know, the, the, the ocean and shoreline and see these seagulls fighting over you know, food. They, just, they can be cruel. The concepts of sharing and manners don't exist among gulls when they're together. They are fiercely competitive and jealous. And if you tie a ribbon or something around the leg of one seagull and make it stand out, they will attack that seagull and pretty much you've given it a sentence to death. The others will attack it with claws and beaks and make it a bloody mess. That's the seagull. But there's another bird that I think I would more aspire to be like, and that is the goose. And let's see, what time of year? Uh, we're getting close to that time of year fall, right? When you see the formations of the geese, Canadian geese flying south for the winter. That V formation enables them to fly with ease and speed. Those of you who are into physics and aerodynamics understand what's going on. In a V, wind resistance is minimized. And so the lead bird is the one who takes it all. But when that lead bird gets tired, guess what? He moves back in position, and another bird who's stronger will take the lead. And the easiest flight is for those in the far back because of the wind and being pulled, if you've gone on a bike and you're, you're trailing behind, you're getting the wind pulling you along. So it's the easiest. And in fact, what happens is that the geese allow the weaker geese, the younger geese, or the older age ones, to take those positions. In addition, they've been told that the honking that the geese do as they're flying is to encourage the other ones to know, we're with you. We're all together. We can make this happen. And so you got the comparison, you got the contrast. You got the seagulls, when they're together, they go after each other, it's, you know, it's all or nothing, it's, it's me, it's all about me. And then you got the geese, where they're working together as a team, trying to support one another. So we can fly further with our Christian brothers and sisters, even with our own family members, if we act like geese. So let's learn the lesson from Joseph and his family, that we need to not hold grudges, that we need to not play favoritism, that we need to avoid jealousy, and we need to be sensitive with one another. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your love and mercy. We pray that you would be with us. Lord, you never called us to be here alone on earth, but to be with one another. And that first group is our family. And that should be the closest relationship we have. But many times, Lord, in our families, it is so strained. I pray that even now, if there are those kind of relationships, that we, as your followers, would work on mending those relationships. And Lord, in our church family, at work, in school, we would do the same. We would strive to get along and be better at accepting and loving one another. We're going to trust you, Lord, that this message will not go unheeded. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, please uh, stand if you're able for the final song.
presence. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for dying on that cross for us. And Holy Spirit, we thank you for giving us the power to live these lives victorious. Be with us as we go on our way, helping us to learn how to love others, care for others, and be Jesus to them. For we pray this in his name. Amen. Have a great day in the Lord. Please join us for a meal and uh, good seeing you all.